Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elio Huerta. I am the director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence Innovation. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Jonathan Kahn. Uh, Jonathan is a theoretical astrophysicist whose primary research is around dark matter detection. He graduated from MIT and then completed postdocs at Princeton and the University of Chicago and then joined uh, Illinois faculty in 2019. And he has a strong interest in using tools from theoretical physics to understand AI theory. And today he is going to be presenting uh, his talk entitled Topological Obstructions to Autoencoders. Uh, please, Johnny, take it away. Thanks a lot. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, this is visible to everyone? Yep. Yep. Great. So thanks so much for the invitation to give this seminar. Um, so my day job is as a, a theoretical uh, particle physicist, astrophysicist. Um, so I think about dark matter most of my time, and it's been a lot of fun to spend about 10% of my time thinking about um, you know, ways that machine learning can be useful in physics. And in particular, as Elio mentioned, ways that we can potentially use tools from physics to understand um, you know, some of the black box aspects of AI. Um, so uh, this is a little bit outside of my comfort zone. So I'm, I think, speaking to uh, a new audience and I'm um, you know, learning a lot of things about uh, AI as I'm uh, working on this. So I invite questions or comments throughout the talk. You know, feel free to uh, interrupt. Um, I'm happy to have a discussion as, as we go. So this is work in progress uh, with Joshua Batson, uh, Christine Grace Hoff, and Dan Roberts, which will hopefully be on the archive soon. So let me just get started. So uh, just to define some of the terms in my title, and by the way, thank you so much to Aaron for the really nice talk last week, which I think set up everything that I'm going to be talking about extremely well. So I'm going to skip a lot of the background because he did it so beautifully last week. Um, so first, let me just define for you what I mean by an autoencoder. So colloquially, it, colloquially, it's just some kind of compression and decompression algorithms. You have some data that's embedded in some high dimensional space. You compress it to sort of learn its essential features, and then you uncompress it again, and you see what you get. Um, and the goal is for the decompression to be as good as possible on your data, but as bad as possible on any other input that lives in the same ambient space as the data, but doesn't belong to your data set. So another way to think of an autoencoder is it's supposed to approximate the identity function on your data, but give you garbage on, on any other input. And so you can measure that with a loss function, which is just the output of the autoencoder minus the data itself. In other words, the, the data is the label that you're trying to learn. So normal data should have good reconstruction or low loss, but anomalous data should have poor reconstruction. So you know, one kind of traditional use for autoencoders is as anomaly detectors. So in the center of the screen, you see a bunch of cat pictures from the CIFAR data set. So there are a bunch of 32 by 32 pixel images, um, RGB colors. So the dimension of the data, are, the, uh, the data is embedded in um, a set of dimension 32 by 32 by three. Um, but obviously, the space of the set of cat pictures doesn't fill out that entire space because you know random colored pixels would also belong to that space. So as you know, the speaker mentioned last week, we hypothesize that the manifold of cat images is some smaller dimension manifold embedded in this higher dimensional space. So on the left is just some cartoon of that. Um, and then you use your encoder to try to compress that to some dimension D, which is much, much less than the ambient dimension. And that's supposed to be something like the intrinsic dimension of the data. It's supposed to parameterize some features, like how many ears does it have, how well separated the eyes, that kind of thing. And then if you look at the bottom right, um, so that is a picture of a truck, which is not a cat. So the idea is that if you pass that image through the trained autoencoder, it should have bad reconstruction. And so it should be flagged as anomalous because it doesn't belong to the manifold of, of cat images. So um, in trying to apply this to physics, um, things are actually a little bit simpler than they are in kind of the wild. Uh, and the reason is, you know, what is the dimension of the manifold of cat images? I'm not really sure. And in fact, it might not even be a well-defined question because the number of features in your image depends on how fine-grained your picture is. Indeed, you know, if, if the image is too pixelated, you wouldn't be able to see a cat at all. But as you zoom in more and more and get more pixels, you can see fur and whiskers and all that kind of stuff. And those add dimensions to the manifold. So rather than addressing that uh, rather difficult question on, on which there has been a considerable amount of work, let's turn instead to the examples in physics, where we're lucky because all of the data that we care about, at least in high energy physics, which, is, uh, which takes place at particle accelerators, comes from a manifold that goes by the name of Lorentz invariant phase space. So I'm gonna talk a lot more about this at the end of the talk. Right now, it's just a name. And 
it's the set of coordinates that parameterizes the independent energy and momenta of particles in a collision. So if you imagine it, so this picture here comes from an event display at the Large Hadron Collider um, at CERN outside Geneva. So you have two high energy particles coming in. Those are the blue arrows. They collide together and they create some other particles. And you can kind of see them because they're depicted by these cones of these colored kind of towers, which represent the energy deposited in your detector. So here you have something like four high energy outgoing particles. And the dimension of this manifold or this data set is 3n minus 4, where n is the number of, of outgoing particles that you have. So the physics data that we care about lives on this manifold. And so talking about its dimension is, is a well-defined thing, as long as the number of particles is a well-defined quantity. So um, you know, based on this observation, there has been a, a decent amount of work in the last several years of using autoencoders as generalized anomaly detectors in physics. And the reason we might want to do this is because these particle colliders, especially the one at CERN, have been running for several years now. We've been looking for hints of physics beyond the so-called standard model, which is the, the set of forces and interactions that we know about. We haven't really found any unambiguous evidence yet. And we want to make sure that we're mining the data for all possible potential new signals that we might not even think of. And so having a kind of an independent, uh, you know, a, a signal independent way to do anomaly detection would be very useful because then you're not prejudicing yourself only looking for the kind of signal that you thought was going to be there as opposed to the kind that you didn't think was going to be there, but was there anyway. So the way this might work is um, on the left is a cartoon of what we call an underlying event. So it's some theorist cartoon of a particle production process through a collision. So here maybe two particles come in and three particles come out. But often complicated things happen on the way to what you actually see at the end of the readout from your particle detector. So there's lots of interesting physics in that blue arrow, which I'm not going to get into. But what you see at the end of the day is what's known as, um, in this context, a jet image. So here you can imagine it again as sort of a, a square, you know, maybe 32 pixels by 32 pixels. But the color in each pixel represents the energy deposited in that fine grained segment of an energy detector called a calorimeter. So that would kind of be a picture of one of the particles in, in this event. Um, and these jet images are much easier than cat images because we know the underlying manifold uh, that the data is drawn from. So I will say that most of the applications for autoencoders have been trying to understand the properties of, of, of these jet images. What I'll focus on in this talk is something that should actually be an easier problem, which is particles that look much more like the cartoon on the left. So there are certain kinds of particles, we call them leptons, that really behave in your detector just as if they were just localized energy momentum, you know, kind of one particle going in a certain direction. And so we don't actually need necessarily this, this complicated jet image, as long as you know the energy and momentum of the particle, you've, you've fully defined uh, uh, what it's doing. So I'm going to focus more on the, you know, for th those that know a little bit of physics, I'm going to focus more on the kind of events on the left than the ones on the right for this talk. OK, so let's actually now think a little bit more carefully about what we mean by an anomaly or an anomalous event in the context of particle physics. So a traditional an anomaly in, in machine learning might be something that lives off the manifold, right? Like that truck in the set of cat pictures. Um, this is sometimes useful for physics, especially in this context of these jet images, when the number of particles is actually not a well-defined number. So it's a somewhat surprising fact that you thought you produced one particle, but actually there could be a lot of very low energy particles that are nearly aligned with that one particle to kind of accompany it. And so defining exactly how many particles you have is a little bit ambiguous. And in that case, the, this off the manifold idea of an anomaly, you know, you thought you had one particle, but you actually have two, uh, might be a useful, um, a useful characterization. But another perspective uh, is that rare events are anomalous events live on sub-manifolds of some even higher dimensional manifold. And the motivation for this is that in quantum mechanics, basically anything that can happen consistent with symmetry principles will happen eventually. So there might be a lot of boring data that fill out some, some manifold of kind of background events. And there might be some signal events that you're looking for that are rare, but they live on that same phase space manifold that your background data did. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on trying to answer the question, can autoencoders be useful in detecting this kind of second picture of anomalies where you're thinking about undersampled or rare sub-manifolds rather than things that actually live off of your data manifold entirely? OK, so let me now define the last term in my title that might be a little bit unfamiliar to those of you that don't do um, math uh, of this kind on a, on a daily basis. So the dimension of a data manifold is not the only number which determines its structure. And a really nice way to see this is to think about the Earth. So 
topologically, the Earth is a sphere. Um, so, you know, on the left is, is some kind of, uh, you know, rendering of the Earth as it might be seen from space. But, you know, if you want to look at a picture of the Earth in a book, you might project it onto a map. What that does is you're mapping the sphere into the plane, R2. Both of those are two-dimensional manifolds, meaning that it only takes two coordinates to tell you where you are on the manifold. So latitude and longitude on the sphere, for example. But when you try to map the sphere into a plane, you break and distort some things. And this is most familiar if you look at Antarctica and Greenland, right? They're not actually as big as they look. You know, surprisingly, if you go and look at you know, the globe of the Earth, Greenland is really not, not that big at all. It looks big because you're distorting some points on the sphere. So this plot on the right, which is a Mercator projection, distorts the North and the South Pole. And that's kind of an unavoidable fact of the fact that the sphere does not have the same topology as the plane. And another important fact is that um, you know, those two points marked by red dots, they look far away on this map, right? They're at opposite ends of the map. But of course, we know they're actually the same point because if you go off the right edge of the map, you come back on the left. So this is just to make the point that the dimension of a manifold measures local properties, as in how many coordinates do you need to define where you are on that manifold? But topology measures global properties, like what happens when you go around the whole thing, you come back to where you started. Um, so a manifold that has non-trivial topology, like the sphere, cannot be mapped into um, Rn, where, or Rd, where D is the, the dimension of that manifold, with a single coordinate system. You need some overlapping set of coordinate systems, or you need to break and tear the manifold in various places, and then things get distorted and, and ripped apart. OK, so with those preliminaries out of the way, the outline of my talk um, is here. So I'll be trying to answer the question, how does the topology of your data set affect the performance of an autoencoder that you're using to try to encode and decode that data set? Um, and we're going to build intuition through a series of low dimensional examples, which are much lower dimensional than anything that will be found in the wild. But they're nice because they illustrate all the essential points. And in fact, we have some analytic control. We can open up the black box of the neural network and then actually study the evolution of all the network parameters analytically, at least in the case for, for dimension one. So then I'll show you some pretty pictures in dimension two. In higher dimensions, it'll be harder to visualize. So I'll introduce a tool that we can use to visualize how much tearing and stretching is happening in this data manifold. And then at the end of the talk, I'll come back to this example of uh, phase space, which is the one that, at least for high energy physics, we're most interested in. So maybe let me just briefly pause for questions now, if there are any questions people have about the setup here. Okay, so um, just so that we're all on the same page, the architecture for the autoencoders I'll be using in this talk um, is as follows. So the encoder will be some one or two layer fully connected feed forward neural network that goes from R capital N to some smaller dimension RD. So my input is just N neurons. And then I go to some wide layer uh, with width W much larger than N because N will be one or two for these low dimensional examples. I want to make sure my network has enough capacity to actually learn things. And then I'll compress to my uh, um, latent representation, which has dimension D, which is going to be less than the input dimension, so that it actually is doing some compression of the data. I'll call the thing that comes out of the encoder um, uh, F encoder of X. And then the decoder will itself again be a fully connected neural network with the same architecture as the encoder, but no nonlinearity on the output so that I don't you know, prejudice myself about having the you know, data have to lie between minus one and one like it would for, the, for a Tanch activation function. Um, and then my loss function is just, again, the output of the whole network, which is the composition of the encoder and the decoder minus the data itself on squared. And then I will train this network with stochastic gradient descent. OK, so let's start with the simplest manifold in one dimension that has non-trivial topology, which is the unit circle. Um, I said unit circle, but topology only cares about kind of relative, um, uh, relative geometry and not distances. Actually, this could be a you know, circle of, of any size, but um, but we'll talk about the unit circle for now. So this is just a, a thousand exactly uniformly spaced points, at least to machine precision, that lie on the unit circle. So this is known as S1, and it's embedded in R2 because I'm drawing the circle on a plane. Um, so I can measure the coordinates of any point on the circle by the angle phi from the x-axis. And so that point that the arrow is pointing to has coordinates cosine phi and sine phi. And then, of course, this manifold is one dimensional because you only need one number to specify a point on the circle. OK, so that was the easy part. So what do I mean by the fact that the circle has non-trivial topology? There's two related facts. And so the first is that you can't unwrap the circle without breaking it. Um, if you try to map the circle into a line, 
Well, a line has two endpoints, as you need to know, you know, which points on the circle that are nearby are going to get mapped to points on the ends of the line, which are far away. And this is related to the fact that this angle phi is periodic. So phi and phi plus two pi represent the same point because as I go all the way around the circle, I come back to where I started. So we're going to train this autoencoder of the architecture that I mentioned on the previous slide um, with a latent dimension d equals one on this data set and see what happens. Okay, so here's a movie. So as you can see, it's, you know, this network has hundreds of parameters. It's learning most of the circle pretty well, but there's an obvious problem. Um, that gap on the left side is having a really hard time closing. Um, so uh, I think I've got something like, um, ooh, I don't know, maybe 500 epochs every 10 seconds. So this is kind of, a, there's, there's a lot of learning that's happening here, but the gap is closing very, very slowly. And again, this is due to the fact that your latent space is not the circle, it's R1, it's the line. And so you need to figure out you know, where those ends go and nearby points on the circle have to be mapped to points far away on the line because you can't unwrap the circle uh, without breaking it. So we're just seeing this topological fact realized um, empirically with, with this network. Um, and then even when the latent dimension equals the intrinsic dimension, as I did here, the circle is one dimensional, my latent space is one dimensional. There's very, very poor reconstruction error around this gap, which I'll be calling the breakpoint for the rest of the talk. Um, and you know, if you thought that autoencoders were supposed to be compressing the data to its intrinsic dimension, there's an obvious problem here because there's part of the manifold that it just can't learn, that it's performing poorly on due to the topology of the circle. OK, so let's do this again. So if I now initialize another network with random weights and biases and I train it, the same qualitatively similar thing happens, but the breakpoint ends up in a different place, as you can see on the plot on the left. So this is actually really interesting from a physics perspective because this is a canonical example of what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking. So my data set was exactly, to machine precision, equally spaced points around the unit circle. Every point is as good as every other point. There is absolutely no preferred point on the circle to determine where the breakpoint is going to go. But the breakpoint has to go somewhere. And so at the end of training, the network spontaneously breaks the symmetry of the rotation symmetry of the circle because it has to choose a point where the loss is going to be worse. Um, and we know in physics that when there are examples of things like this that happen, that symmetry is imprinted somehow on the network parameters here, you know, pro probably on the lost landscape. And so in future work, we're very interested in investigating, can we use the tools of spontaneous symmetry making in physics to understand the lost landscape of this autoencoder, which is actually quite rich, despite the fact that data is only one dimensional. Okay, so in the middle plot, what I'm showing you is the latent representation, right? This is just a one dimensional representation. So I can actually plot it on the y-axis as a function of the coordinate phi on the circle on the x-axis. So this function wants to be monotonic, right? It wants to map any given phi onto some point in the latent map, but functions on the circle have to be periodic and you can't have a monotonic function that's periodic. Just imagine trying to draw a curve, right? It can't go back to itself unless it goes up and down again. And that's what you see happening here. So that large spike in the encoder corresponding to a large derivative of the encoder is exactly at the breakpoint. And we're going to focus a lot on that um, in the next several slides. And then, of course, right, the loss is worst at the breakpoint. It's orders of magnitude worse than the generic loss for another point on the circle. And so I just want to emphasize that these features are totally independent of the training algorithm. And you know, except for the latent representation, um, totally independent of the network architecture. So the topology, the topology of the circle says you can't map it into a line. And so you're going to see these same features kind of no matter what you do, unless you drastically change the network architecture, for example, to try to co cover the circle with two different coordinate systems. OK, so here's a maybe a somewhat more surprising example. Instead of taking 1,000 uniformly spaced points on the circle, let's just take 50 of them. So they're marked with these red Xs. You can see them very clearly. You know, they're separated even by I. And surely you might think, a 400 parameter, five layer, fully connected neural network with, with 100,000 epochs of training can memorize these 50 data points, right? The lore that we've all learned is, you know, if you overtrain, you're going to memorize your data set. The surprise here is that actually is not true. You know, at least for the network architecture that I've given, um, the uh, network does not learn at least two of those points. You can see that it can't even reconstruct those two X's down on the, um, uh, the, the bottom of that left plot. Um, you know, maybe less surprisingly, it puts the breakpoint kind of in between two of its data points. So now if I look at the loss on a uniformly sampled um, test set, you know, those blue points that are shown there that, that fill in the points that um, 
um, that the uh, uh, that I didn't give it um, as a training set. You know, the worst loss happens, you know, not exactly at one of those those training points, but the loss is still pretty bad. Um, and you know, you see the same structure in the latent representation that you saw uh, for the the more densely sampled circle. So this is already very interesting. You know, 50 points. You know, not a large data size, but if the data set has topology, and actually there's a way of measuring the topology of discrete data sets known as persistent homology. Um, then you see the same things happen, and, and in fact, you can't memorize these 50 points, at least for this, this amount of training. Okay, so now let's take one more example um, of a data set on the circle. So let's undersample around a certain point phi u. So I'm sampling the circle with a probability density, which is just a normal distribution whose uh, mean is diametrically opposite to this phi u, so it's on the other side of the circle, and then a variance of, of 0.9, just so I'm undersampling enough you can just see it by eye. And here you can guess where the breakpoint is going to go once I train this network. So unsurprisingly, the breakpoint ends up in the undersampled region because now the data has broken the symmetry, right? Now there are points in the circle that are special. They're the rare ones where there isn't a lot of data. And because the autoencoder is trying to minimize the average loss, it does best when it reconstructs the points that it sees the most and kind of gives up on the points that it doesn't know. Okay, so the worst loss is not exactly at the mean of the distribution, but of course, this is just one draw from the sampling distribution. If I did this many, many, many times, the average point of worst loss would end up at, at the mean of the distribution that I was sampling. Um, so, you know, here's an example where, you know, in this kind of second picture of anomalies, if anomalous data means unlikely data, then here, at least for this circle example, the autoencoder loss is a good diagnostic. And so inspired by this, you know, one might try to think about improving the signal to noise of autoencoders by exploiting the data topology and forcing it to break at the points that are that are rare, which are the ones that you're, you're looking for. Okay, uh, any questions on uh, the talk so far? Okay, Yanni, I actually have a quick question. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused. So I understand your main point here, but I'm confused. Why is the autoencoder inherently linear to begin with? Maybe you said this. And oh, I'm it's just not. Confused. It's not. So why should we fundamentally think that uh, something that has topology should be hard for it to capture if it's not sort of? So what, what, what you've been arguing is that mapping from a line to a circle is tricky, but why should I think we have to map from a line to begin with? This is what I'm confused about. Sorry, it's mapping from a circle to a line that's tricky. So the point is that if your latent dimension is one, by definition, that means that you're, you're, you know, you have one neuron, and so the latent space is just R. Unless you find a way to give topology to the latent space, you're inevitably mapping from some manifold, which has whatever topology it does, to a topologically trivial latent space, which is Rn. But, but I thought your point for the last few minutes is that you had lots of neurons, and so the latent space doesn't necessarily have to just be one. Uh, no, so good. Um, so let me just go back to my, uh, so this is the structure, right? So here um, on the left, D is going to be one. So I'm going to have a wide layer of with like 50 neurons, and then that thing is all going to go down to a single, a single neuron. Okay, great. That's what I mean. The nonlinearity happens in that wide layer, but the, the, so what I'm going to get to next is that actually, you know, having hundreds of parameters in the wide layer is basically not doing anything for you. Like there is a nonlinearity, right? You're, I'm applying some tanch function after this wide layer, but, but that's not helping you fix this topological obstruction that no matter how you're trying to map to R, you have to tear something somewhere. Okay, that makes a lot more sense, thank you. Good, yeah, thanks. Uh, any more questions? And I think there's something in the chat, but I can't see it, so maybe. Good, so yeah, so the, the nice thing about the circle example is, okay, so here's the network diagram I probably should have shown, um, is that there are few enough parameters that we can actually start to do some analytical studies of, of what's going on. Okay, so here explicitly is my encoder part of the network. So my data is points x, y, so cosine phi and sine phi in this coordinate system. I then map to some wide layer. Um, in most examples, it's gonna have width 50. So the index i runs from one to 50. Um, and then I'm going to define these pre-activations, which are just the input to those neurons. So it's some, you know, weights and biases coming from the first layer. And then I map those things down to that single neuron with uh, activation function generically here called sigma, but I'm going to usually take this to be the tanch function. So then I await that thing, I add a bias, and that is my encoder map in blue. Um, so you can think of this as a function of the network parameters, which I can label theta alpha, 
And you can also think of it as a function of the data, xi. And here, um, because the data is uh, defined by one coordinate, phi, I can think of this as a function of phi also. OK, so then my loss is just going to be this you know, sum over all the data points of the composition of the encoder and the decoder minus the data. So a necessary condition for me to be at the trained minimum of the network is for the gradient of the loss with respect to the encoder parameters to vanish. Of course, it also has to, the gradient with respect to all the other parameters, including the decoder parameters, has to vanish. But we can get a lot of mileage just by looking at the gradient with the encoder. And this is, again, a sufficient, uh, or, sorry, a necessary condition um, for me to be at, at the end of training at the, at the loss minimum. So what you can see is the product of these three terms just by using the chain rule. So the term in black will vanish if there's perfect reconstruction. And so we know empirically that most of the circle is going to be reconstructed well. So we're going to now assume that that black thing doesn't vanish. And we're going to try to use the loss gradient to understand where the breakpoint is going to happen. So if the black term doesn't vanish, then one of the terms on the right uh, has to vanish, sort of data point by data point. Um, it's unlikely that the green term is going to vanish, because that would require the decoder to be independent of the latent representation to first order, meaning that it kind of just puts the point anywhere. It doesn't care where, where it is in the latent space. So that seems like that's not going to happen very much because it's not really learning anything about what the data is. And so um, what we expect to happen is that the blue term is going to vanish. So the gradient of the encoder with respect to the network parameters um, will, uh, will tend to vanish uh, near the breakpoint. OK, so now let's actually just compute the derivatives of the encoder with respect to these five sets of network parameters. So the second layer weights wi2, the first layer weights wix and wiy, and the biases uh, bi and b2. And just by looking at the set of equations, uh, one finds that uh, this set of gradients never actually vanishes entirely, you can see, because the, the last term is never going to vanish. However, there's lots of parameters. And so this thing can be close to 0 as long as most of these terms are small. And it's smallest when most of the weights are small. But a few of the weights can be large as long as their preactivation zi vanish. So now we can also look at the derivative of the encoder with respect to the data. So this is df by d phi. And just computing that thing explicitly, you see that the encoder derivative is largest when these same sets of conditions hold, when some weights are large whose preactivations vanish. And as we saw from the plots of the latent representation, we know the latent map has to kind of break somewhere. So the region where the latent map has a large derivative is where we expect the breakpoint to happen. And so at the train network minimum, we expect to see a couple weights are large, but the corresponding preactivations going into that node um, are going to be small. And in fact, just by looking at the evolution of the network parameters as a function of training, we can see exactly that happen. So here, let's look, look at the evolution of the weights w2. So here, there are 50 of them. And you can see two in green and purple that kind of start in the middle of the pack but evolve to have very large magnitude. And then if you plot their corresponding um, preactivations uh, at the value of phi that ends up being the breakpoint, you see, again, those preactivations start kind of at a random place, but then evolve towards 0. So empirically, indeed, this is what's happening. And we can now make some plots of um, what the preactivations look like to try to understand how their zeros determine where this network breakpoint is. Um, and so again, I'll emphasize the topology of the circle means that this zi, this preactivation, is going to be a periodic function on the circle, which means generically it's going to have two roots. So if I look at the largest magnitude weight at the end of training, so it turns out that the breakpoint, as, as I'll show you in the next plot, is determined by that red line, which is where one of the zeros of this preactivation is. But this, as a function of phi, has two zeros. So that other zero in green should also give you a large encoder derivative. But we see empirically that it doesn't. And the reason why is that another weight evolves to be large but opposite in sign, and therefore it cancels off that second, um, that second zero. However, that function, again, has two zeros. And its second zero is not going to be at exactly the same place as the zero of the first one. And so what ends up happening is there's, there's an almost perfect cancellation around the green region. You can see those wiggles. They're still there, but it's still pretty small. But there's a pretty bad imperfect cancellation around the breakpoint. And what's going on here is that because of kind of this chain of, well, you know, every function has two zeros, and you kind of have to cancel off one by the other, so there's kind of a cascading series of weights that have to evolve together, getting smaller and smaller in magnitude. This is a fine tuning problem. And so here, the, um, this, 
the reason there's a finite gap around the breakpoint, the reason it never really heals entirely, is that it's hard for the network to find the, the loss minimum that exactly cancels off all of these weights pairwise. And so here we see topology ma being manifested in a concrete case through the network dynamics um, because of you know, just looking at how the weights and the, the, the biases evolve and understanding how that determines you know, where the, where the breakpoint is going to happen in, uh, in the encoder map. Okay, any questions on this discussion? Okay, so let's move on to some more fun manifolds that are one-dimensional. So let's look at knots. Um, so here is what's known as the trefoil knot. So you can describe it as a parametric curve in three dimensions. So it only takes one number to specify where you are on the knot, but it's embedded in three dimensions. It has the same intrinsic topology as a circle because phi and phi plus two pi take you back to the same point. But it also has extrinsic topology, which depends on its embedding. So it means that you can embed it in R3 with no crossings, as you can see as this knot is rotating. But if you try to project this onto any plane, if you try to look at its shadow, for example, you can kind of see in the back of this thing, any shadow of that knot will have crossings. And so these self-intersections are an avatar of extrinsic topology, which is again going to prove an obstruction to, to training. Okay, so let's do kind of uh, the first thing, which is just to try to uh, train an autoencoder with latent dimension one on this knot. Again, one is the intrinsic dimension of this knot, but there are problems both with intrinsic and extrinsic topology. So you see the same issues with a circle, but they're even worse. Right? So this is the latent representation as a function of the, the uh, phi coordinate. So you see these huge spikes. So again, it kind of doesn't know what to do with the circle. Um, but the overall loss is just terrible. And as you can see from the, the plot on the left, so the data is in blue. And the output of the autoencoder on a uh, test set following that same distribution is shown in green. It's not approximating the knot very well at all. Um, so I will mention that I think the first investigation of knots and um, uh, neural networks that I'm aware of um, was pointed out in this blog post that was mentioned in last week's intro from, I think, 2014, trying to look at, can you classify uh, different, um, uh, uh, different data sets if they're actually knotted together? OK, so let me show you another fun movie, which is what happens when you move to d equals 2. So um, just looking at sort of as this, this uh, autoencoder is trying to train, you know, kind of not much is happening. And then all of a sudden, it kind of gets itself out of a local minimum. Um, but then things kind of go haywire because it doesn't really know what to make of these self-intersection points. And so as you can see from the, the color bar, the losses are localized at these self-intersection points. Um, and so this is an issue in uh, extrinsic topology that you can't even, you, you, you can't fix this even by having a latent space, which is larger dimension than the intrinsic dimension of your data. Yanni, can I interrupt really quickly? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I, I was wondering if like if, if for the latent variable, would it help if you have like a complex um, number over there that, that you're trying to learn? Uh, good. So I, I'm, I think I'm going to get to that on the next slide. I think I know what you're asking and I'm going to, yeah. And for your movie, um, in that region where it paused a little bit, it looked like it was a projection of the knot onto R2. Was that? Certainly it's the projection of the knot onto some plane. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to figure out which plane it is, but, but I mean, you can like the nice thing about these latent spaces is you can really visualize what's going on. Um, so it certainly seems to be, that's what it's doing. And then I think that the, the next slide will give you some interesting uh, insight into what happens when I, when I try to let it cure these self intersections. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, I, the, the person who just asked the question was, was very astute. So, you know, I'm kind of penalizing the network a little bit because I know something about the knot that it doesn't know. So I know that the knot is param uh, parametrized by this parametric curve. It has the intrinsic topology of the circle. So let me force the network to learn that a parametric representation of the knot is just a circle parametrized by this latent representation x phi, which is cosine phi and sine phi. So adding this term to the loss is going to force the latent representation to be a circle. As we're going to see from this movie, it's going to cure the self-intersections. You can kind of see them kind of unwinding themselves. You can imagine you know, putting a rubber band down and then kind of like pushing the ends apart and seeing them kind of you know, come undone from each other. And that definitely helps. But as you can see right now, the self-intersections in the decoder still pose a problem. So the latent representation has learned very well a circle. But, and the, you know, the knot is definitely better approximated by this network, but it's still not perfect. There are still points at which this breaks because you can't ever really cure this extrinsic topology uh, entirely. And indeed, you can see that there's still kind of cusps in the latent representation. Those self-intersections are still there, but the nonlinearities are kind of pinching them off into, you know, very, very localized regions. 
goes on for a while. Okay, so with those examples out of the way, let's move on to dimension two. And so let's try to auto encode the sphere. Um, so uh, here we're going to introduce a plot which is going to be very useful for higher dimensional spaces, which is this plot on the right. So um, once I train an autoencoder with latent dimension two, um, you know, my input data has dimension three because it's a sphere embedded in three dimensions. Um, and on the right, what I'm plotting is the loss on a test set as a function of the distance to the point with the worst loss. So what this is basically measuring is, is the loss correlated with the distance from the point where the map breaks? Um, and as you can kind of see from the output of the autoencoder on the far left, and then this moleweed projection, which is a projection into two dimensions um, in the middle, the map is kind of breaking localized near a point. Um, and so what we think is going on is that the neural network is learning stereographic projection. So there is a way to map a sphere to the plane R2 that only breaks at a single point. And the map is kind of shown pictorially here. You put the sphere tangent to the plane, you start at the North Pole, you just draw a line through the point on the sphere and where it intersects in the plane is, is, is your map. Um, and you can see that this map is gonna break at the North Pole because of course, if you're tangent to the sphere at the North Pole, you'll never intersect the plane. So there is no point, um, it's off at infinity. Um, and, and this seems to be what the network is learning. Okay, however, let me take another data set. So instead of uniformly sampling the sphere, let me excise the equator entirely from the training set. So I'm only gonna train it on a North hemisphere and a Southern hemisphere. And I'm gonna excise a region in uh, uh, width 0.1 in, in the Z coordinate around the equator that's shown by these green lines. So now once I train the autoencoder and I give it a uniformly sampled test set, now including the equator, it has no problem filling in the equator in most of the region of course, the map has to break at a point. Unsurprisingly, it minimizes the loss by breaking at the equator, but not the entire equator, right? The points that are diametrically opposite the point where the map breaks have as small loss as any other generic point on the sphere. So this is an interesting counterexample to you know, our, our intuition from the circle. So undersampling a submanifold poses no problems for interpolation, right? If I thought that my anomalous data that lives on this undersampled submanifold on the equator was going to be flagged with large loss, I'm out of luck because a lot of points on the equator are actually reconstructed with no problem at all. And the reason is that the topology of the sphere only requires the map to tear when you map it to R2 at a single point. It can interpolate the rest of the manifold uh, with, with no problem. So this is already kind of a hint that there, this, this, this idea of exploiting the topology might not be quite so trivial as just undersampling and then seeing those things are going to have large loss because they weren't in the training set. Okay, so another fun example in two dimensions. So any two dimensional manifold can be classified by the number of holes that it has. So topologically, this number is called the genus. So the genus zero manifold is a sphere. You can take out a single point and map it into R2. But if you have a genus one manifold like a torus that has a hole in the middle, in order to unroll it, you know, you have to cut it this way and then unroll it to a cylinder and then cut it along the axis and unroll it again. And another way of saying this is the intrinsic topology is the product of two circles. So in the picture on the bottom right, it's like you imagine you're in Mario land, right? If you run off the right side, you come back on the left. If you run off the top, you come back on the bottom. And so these pairs of edges are identified. That's global topology, even though the local geometry is totally trivial, it's just, it's just a plane. So again, running the same experiment. So let me embed the torus in R3. That looks like a donut. Um, I'm gonna train it now with a, a five layer network of the kind that I've been showing you. And I'll even give it a little bit more juice and I'll add a layer both to the encoder and the decoder, give it even more parameters and look at what the loss as a function of the distance to the worst point looks like. And even after 20,000 epochs of training, what you see is it doesn't look like the sphere at all. There's still many widely separated points with order one loss. The map is kind of not breaking at one point, it's breaking kind of everywhere. Um, and again, the latent dimension of this autoencoder is the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. The torus is just a two dimensional manifold, but its global topology is posing huge problems for trying to reconstruct uh, a, a training or a test set that, that sampled from the same set as the training set. So let me now do the following. So let me try to embed the torus into R4. This is mathematically what's known as the Clifford torus. And so it's just two independent circles. So X and Y are cosine theta, sine theta. Z and W are cosine phi and sine phi. So locally, these are circles are just totally independent. Their coordinates don't know anything about one another. But in order to embed the torus in R3, I know that I need the circles to kind of join on one another. And so now if I run an autoencoder with this data embedded in dimension four, 
and have my autoencoder have latent dimension three, I know that there is no topological obstruction to finding the embedding of the torus in R3 because I know it exists, it's just a donut. So I know that, that there exists a continuous map from R4 to R3 that maps this Clifford torus into the usual torus in R3. However, what we find is that the autoencoder doesn't find it. So you can look at the latent representation map as points in three dimensions on the right. And instead of looking like a whole donut, it looks kind of like the Homer Simpson donut, right? Where you've taken a bite out of both ends. And the reason is that it doesn't figure out that the two circles need to join. So it reconstructs one of the circles, a so-called poloidal one that kind of goes around, you know, spiraling around the donut, but it never joins the two ends uh, because that's a global topology, which, which I'm not forcing the network to try to learn. It's learning the local geometry very well, but it's having problems, you know, understanding how these circles join globally. Okay. So now kind of moving on to higher dimensions, and these are gonna be a little bit harder to visualize, but this loss versus distance plot is gonna be very useful. So I'm now gonna talk about the manifolds, which are the Lie groups, SU2 and, and SO3. So for those that do physics, this is the physicist's favorite example of two manifolds, which are equivalent locally, but differ globally by topology. So SU2 is a set of two by two complex matrices um, that, have, um, um, that, are, that are unitary and have determinant one. So that's two complex numbers with one constraint, and that gives me a three-dimensional manifold. SO3 is a set of three by three matrices with real entries that are orthogonal. So matrix times is transpose equals the identity. That gives you nine numbers with six constraints because it has to be a symmetric matrix. And so that again gives me a three-dimensional manifold. So it turns out that you can get one from the other if you glue together, so to speak, two points of SU2, you get SO3. And so they have the same dimensions, but SO3 is a sort of a, is a quotient space, as we say, of, of SU2. And so more explicitly, SU2 uh, geometrically looks exactly like the sphere, the three-dimensional sphere, S3. But SO3 looks like real projective space, which has different topology. And this is a good case study for a low-dimensional manifold embedded in a much higher dimensional space, which is much closer to the examples in the wild than also the physical example that I'm trying to get to at the end. So what, what I'm going to do is I'll take entries of this two by two complex matrix, I'll flatten them into an eight dimensional vector by just taking real and imaginary parts of each component and just lining them up. Okay, so let me now generate test and training sets of 10,000 elements uniformly sampled from these manifolds. There's a so-called horror measure, which is a um, uh, uh, measure on these manifolds that gives me a, a notion of uniform sampling. I'll flatten them into eight and nine dimensional vectors respectively. Let me train this deeper seven layer network um, and I'll, I'll let the latent dimension vary um, from time to time to see that if, if having a larger latent dimension will help me reconstruct these manifolds better. So first, for the data set SU2, um, with a latent dimension 3, the intrinsic dimension of the data, as you can see, the loss is now very, very much anti-correlated with the distance from the worst point. So this looks like a sphere, as expected, because mathematically we know this data set is a sphere. However, for this other data set, which is identical in as many ways I can make it, this SO3 data set with the same latent dimension, the loss looks kind of like garbage everywhere. Um, and in fact, if I increase the latent dimension of my, man of, of my autoencoder, I don't do much better reconstructing SO3 at all. Whereas if I increase the latent dimension from three to four for SU2, I learn basically the identity map and the loss goes, goes to zero. Um, again, it's not surprising, um, you know, I, the, sphere embedded in R4, I can trivially learn with a latent dimension four. Here, the embedding of SU2 into R8 is also trivial. Um, but SO3 uh, has both intrinsic and extrinsic topology, which is, you know, even as I crank up the latent dimension to be much, much larger than the dimension of my manifold, it's not really helping me at all. OK, so with those examples out of the way, let me now spend like the last five minutes just talking about the physics example where autoencoders have kind of the most application. Um, and so let me now define for you what I mean by three particle phase space. So again, remember that picture from the Large Hadron Collider, I've got two particles coming in. Let's say that I make three particles that are going out. Each particle has an energy and a momentum. The momentum is in three dimensions, there's three components. So three particles times four components equals 12 coordinates. But I have some constraints. So there's some very deep principles in physics which tell me I should expect energy and momentum conservation. So the sum of the energy of these particles should be the initial energy of the collision. And the sum of their momenta should be zero if the initial collision was in the center of momentum coordinate. 
Um, if you remember from special relativity, E equals MC squared, that gets generalized a little bit when a particle is moving to this equation shown here. So that's one constraint for each particle. So I've got one constraint for energy momentum, uh, energy conservation, three for momentum conservation, and three for the um, invariance due to relativity. That's seven constraints. And so if I subtract that from my 12 coordinates, three particle phase space is a five dimensional manifold embedded in R12. Okay, so from now on, I'm gonna set the speed of light equal to one as conventional in, in high energy physics because it just makes some of the formulas look, look a little bit simpler. So suppose instead that two of these particles that I've labeled Y were actually the decay products of some other invisible particle with mass M that, that I don't see, or I guess mass MX. So it turns out that relativity then imposes an additional constraint that if those two particles came from the decay of some other particle, there's this additional constraint that's shown in that equation there that tells me that these set of events live on a four dimensional sub manifold of this five dimensional phase space manifold. So this is a typical anomalous event in the context of particle physics because X might be some new particle that we're trying to discover. We can't see it directly, but instead we have to observe its rare decays to other visible particles. Um, and so we're gonna use uh, this, um, what's known as this invariant mass to try to diagnose whether some new invisible particle uh, was there or not. But first, um, let me just sort of blindly train my autoencoder on uniformly sampled points in phase space. So I'm gonna label the outgoing particles Y, Y, and Z. I'm gonna set the mass of particle Z to zero, but I can let the mass of Y be zero or non-zero. It gives me slightly different geometry for, for the manifold. And so what you see is that, um, you know, there are clearly points where the autoencoder um, loss is, is large. I can't reconstruct this, this manifold exactly. It does have some topology, um, but the points seem pretty isolated because especially in this example where the, the mass of the Y particle is not zero, you see very clearly these two points where the loss is bad and then things kind of fall off as you get farther away from them. And so it looks like the topology of, of phase space, while not the trivial topology of just R5, is kind of sphere-like. So another useful thing that we can plot is this quantity, which, which we call the invariant mass of the two Y particles or, or particles two and three. Um, we call it invariant because it turns out to be the same in any, in any reference frame. So you can compute it in whichever way is easiest. Um, in the coordinates that I've defined, when my equals zero, it's equal to this quantity here. So it's the product of the energies of the two particles times one minus the cosine of the angle between them. And so I can plot the distribution of that quantity this just you know histogram of this number for both my um, uh, test set, which has the same distribution as my training set, and also the output of the encoder run on that test set. So one thing you can see right away is that this quantity m23 goes to zero whenever the energies of the particles go to zero or the angle between them goes to zero, so they end up being collinear. And these kinematic edges in these distributions are very important in, in physics because that's what we use to kind of diagnose if something interesting is going on in, in the event. And you can see very clearly the autoencoder is not doing a great job at diagnosing these, uh, these endpoints. Um, and you know, from the perspective of topology, again, this is not so surprising because if you think about an interval, the endpoints of the interval actually have um, an interval that, that's open is different than an interval that, that's closed. There is some topology contained in the fact that this interval has, has an endpoint as opposed to kind of going off to infinity. Yeah, and, and you also see this very weird feature in the distribution at, at large values of m squared two, three, which is not there in the data at all. It's some feature that's being imprinted by the autoencoder that, that is, is entirely spurious. Okay, so now we can also just look at a scatter plot of the true value of this variable versus the value reconstructed by the autoencoder. And I've color coded this according to the loss, right? But you, this should be exactly a straight line as you can kind of see in this blue band but there's a pretty large scatter. And in fact, the worst loss happens at points where that m squared two, three is very, very small. And it's especially bad when the, when the y particle is massless because when that variable goes to zero, it means the energies of the outgoing particles are, are small or the angles between them are small. Um, so um, I just wanna emphasize these points are, are not anomalous in any way. They're just as good as, as any other point sample from the training set, but they're getting flagged with large loss from the autoencoder due to the topology of this phase space manifold. So now I just wanna end with, you know, how might you try to use an autoencoder to do this anomaly detection that I, that I mentioned way back at the beginning. So my training set had a uniform value of this m squared two, three variable. So if 
these particles y came from the decay of some other heavy particle, I would expect actually the m squared 2, 3 variable to have a delta function distribution at some value. So let's say that value is 0.49, um, corresponding to some heavy particle m or x that had mass of 0.7 in these units. So let me now train an autoencoder on a training set, excluding entirely that region that I'm interested in. So that region with m squared 2, 3 equals 0.49 is not in my training set at all. Now let me sample a test set from that same distribution shown in blue on the left, and then feed that through the autoencoder and look at how it reconstructs this variable. You see, once again, you know, you, this kind of spurious effect at, at a large value of m squared 2, 3. However, it does a pretty good job at identifying the fact that there's no data that sits in, in that, that white interval, that excised interval around this analysis event that I'm looking for. Now, let me sample a test set consisting only of events in this four-dimensional submanifold that have that particular value of that m squared 2, 3 coordinate. Let me feed those through the autoencoder and look at the loss distribution and compare it to the loss distribution on the test set, which had that, um, that excised region in the middle. And you can see the result on the right. And uh, you can see very clearly that they have effectively exactly the same distribution. There is no large tail to the loss distribution of these special events in red. Events which are totally absent from the training set are not flagged as anomalous. And the reason is that the interval, uh, the interior of this interval in this m squared 2, 3 coordinate is topologically trivial. And just like the example where I excised the equator from the sphere, filling in and interpolating this region um, is, is not a problem for autoencoders. And this is just one you know, very concrete example of you know, just because an event is not in your training set doesn't mean that you can detect it as, as anomalous with this network architecture. OK, so let me wrap up. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that this idea of compressing a data set to its intrinsic dimension using a standard neural network architecture is doomed to fail if the data manifold has topology, because that means that your map has to break at at least one point. So we've seen that neural network autoencoders will interpolate locally, like with a sphere and equator example, or this excised phase space example. So there are points with small loss that the network has never seen before. But we can see that autoencoders can fail globally in ways that we can't entirely control if your data set has topology, like the example of the, the torus that can't join on itself in, in R3. So this suggests that we should be you know, careful in thinking about how we would do anomaly detection, and in particular, not try to use these autoencoders just as black boxes that can detect, is it in your data set or is it not in your data set? So as we saw with the example of the knot, if you know the topology of your data, you can try to build this into your network architecture, for example, by modifying the loss function um, or you know, exploiting the fact that the circle has to break at a point. And so undersampling is going to give you a large loss around your, your rare region. Um, and then finally, just the fact that the manifold that we care about in physics, which is phase space, does have topology. And you know, as we've seen from these examples, um, I would suggest we need to be pretty cautious about using black box autoencoders to do this generalized anomaly detection for high energy physics. There are probably ways that we can use knowledge of the topology of phase space to do better. Um, and that's work that I'm very interested in, in pursuing further. So I'll stop there for questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Johnny. So let's give a hand to the speaker. All right. So any questions? Uh, just go ahead, unmute yourself, and ask your question. Um, yeah, hi, Joshua here. So very good talk, I'm very interested. So uh, I, I think there's some work by people that build in some of the symmetric protected uh, loss function, like Hamiltonian neural network and large engine neural network. So is there a, a way that we could in, uh, in principally add these to the Onto encoder so that they learn some of the symmetries in physics? For sure. Um, so, um, you know, uh, one thing that you can check is just, is the autoencoder learning um, energy and momentum conservation? And, and in fact, it's actually doing that pretty well. Um, and the fact that, you know, it, it's doing pretty well at determining this, this relatively invariant coordinate, you know, for, for, for non-zero values of this, this Y particle means it's learning some of that by itself. Certainly, I think if you have some priors on what your data should look like, like that it should conserve energy and momentum, you can absolutely build those into your network. Um, I think, you know, from the topological perspective, you know, one thing you can imagine doing um, is, okay, so this, this fact that you can't cover the circle um, with a single chart, so to speak, you know, if you let yourself have two neurons in your, in your latent space, one kind of learning the top half of the circle and one learning the bottom half of the circle, and then something in the loss that forces it to uh, understand um, 
whether it's um, uh, you know, the transition functions between these two coordinates. Um, sorry, my uh, keynote just quit for some reason. Um, yeah, you, you can imagine building that into the network. And there's actually been some work done already on using autoencoders to learn transition functions on, on manifolds. So this is you know, very much work in progress. This is not the end of the story. And I think there's, there's lots more that can be done here. Very right, cool. Thank you. Yoni, can I ask a question about the simple circle example? Yeah. This is Dave. Hey. So when you um, when you showed us the symmetry breaking, right? That means that for different uh, training data sets, the break occurs at random and uniformly at random problems. Or even for the same training set with different initializations, the break occurs at a random. Oh, okay. So if that's true, then that's sort of like saying that on average, nowhere has a break. If you that's average, right. yeah. Over, if, if you right? plot the distribution of the breakpoints as a right. function of you know, right. multiple instantiations, you'll see that thing has a uniform distribution. Yeah. And so if you trained it twice using two different seeds or you use yep. two different training parameters and you just average your test results, would that give you the right answer? Um, so the problem with a simple average is you can see how bad the loss is at the breakpoint, right? You're still gonna, so basically on average, the loss is not gonna be bad at the two breakpoints. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'd have to do a lot of, mm -hmm. well, I mean, you can kind of already see you'd have to do probably a thousand instantiations to get that to average down everywhere. And it's weird because it shouldn't be that hard to learn a circle. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, time for one final question. The chat says, is there a way to know the topology associated with any data coming from a process? Uh, that's a really good question. And um, I'm not sure of the answer. So I mentioned this thing called persistent homology. So, so the idea with persistent homology um, is that, um, actually, I think you might be able to see my blackboard. So if I have kind of a point cloud in various places, what I can do is try to draw kind of circles around them of a fixed radius. And then depending on whether or not those circles intersect, right? if my data points are kind of close enough together, then at some radius of that circle, those circles will start to intersect. And if I take the union of all of those circle intersections, then that thing kind of looks like a disk. And then I can contract that to a circle and say that data set has the topology of, of a circle. So that's one way of doing it. I, there's not a unique way because topology is a property of continuous spaces and not discrete ones. But you know, using persistent homology to Look at the topology of high dimensional data sets, I think it'd be very interesting. I mean, I'd be curious to say what it saw about the topology of the set of cat pictures. You know, I think this is an under investigated, you know, we know dimension of the data is important. I think the topology of the data is also important. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Johnny, for participating in the seminar series. It was a very interesting talk.